Tschüss, Bebe. Live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's the Q covering Red Hat Summit 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of the Red Hat Summit. I am Rebecca Knight, your host. I'm here with Stu Miniman, and our guest today is Jason Hoffman. He is the Vice President and Global Head of Cloud Infrastructure at Ericsson. Thanks so much for joining us, Eric. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So I want to start out by talking about the cloud market today and where we are. We've heard uh, here at the summit that the number one thing on customers' minds is cloud strategy. Is that, does that resonate with you? And what, what are you hearing from customers? Um, I'm a, clouds, clouds, a, clouds, an interesting topic uh, because it's both, uh, it's both an infrastructure approach. Sometimes people use it for a delivery model. Sometimes people use it to describe a business model. Sometimes people use it to describe a number, a number of things. Um, for me, for most companies, cloud's not strategic. Um, cloud's tactical. Huh. Uh, cloud may be strategic to Amazon. Cloud may be strategic to Microsoft. Um, We've yet to see whether it's truly strategic for Google uh, in that, but for most people it's tactical. Um, and, and I think it's a fine distinction to make because um, tactical means there's stuff to do. And if you look at the thing to do, um, is it's, it's, it's pretty clear that that approach to infrastructure is on highly accessible industrialized infrastructure. Um, and, and I anchor that in infrastructure because in the absence of that type of infrastructure, then your delivery models and business models and stuff don't apply, basically. Yeah. Um, Jason, you bring up an interesting point. Uh, we heard in, the, in the, the first day keynote, they said one of the top priorities for end users is to build a cloud strategy. Because when I talk to most users, hmm. um, they've been very tactical. It's like, well, yeah. you know, we moved our CRM to SaaS. Everybody did. Yeah. I'm starting to move certain business apps to SaaS. Yeah. I've, Everybody tried dev you know, on, yeah. on Amazon and have played with a number of other clouds, but yeah. you look at that, uh, I had a guy that wrote, that wrote for me, he was like, we don't have hybrid cloud, we have composite cloud, because composite I've cloud. got all those things there, it's like, how do I shop? It's like, well, I stop by the convenience store where I need, um, I, I go to the store, I, and I get lots of stuff from Amazon. Sounds like how we do cloud. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, no, exactly. um, you know, w w where do you see from the users that you talk to, I mean, you've, you've been involved in this, you know, since yeah, the early time. days, so, yeah. It, it feels like, you know, we've talked that blah blah cloud stuff, but mm -hmm. it feels like we're getting a little bit more real. I'm heartened to see that users are starting to, you know, think about strategic, how they put things together. Mm -hmm. where, where do you see the customers you're talking to? Well, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the, the customers are educated by the market, and the market tends to use a lot of these marketing terms like composite rather than <laughs> getting down to what the actual sort of issues are. Um, the, the issues, even if we go back to that highly accessible industrialized type infrastructure, I mean, the, the issue there is um, customers need to simplify things. Um, they largely would like to do that through some type of quote unquote uh, automation. Uh, and they, they would like everything that they do under one governance model, essentially, whether you call it life cycle management or governance or whatever. But these types of things that um, uh, both the infrastructure and the nature of the things that you do on it uh, are, are too complex. And um, they tend not to be, you know, once they're basically put in place, they tend not to be touched again. Um, you know, so in fact, if you look at a good definition of like legacy, um, legacy for me is when um, the cost of keeping something as is is basically cheaper than the replacement cost. Right, and actually if you look at that sort of cost curve, um, the, the day that something is um, best to leave as is and it's very expensive to replace is the day it goes live. So, so the legacy curve it's is like actually- driving a new the, car off the legacy the curve is actually a U-shaped curve, mm -hmm. you know, in there. Um, and in fact, the, the day something goes live, it's legacy, and then at some point, three, four, five years down the road, it's not legacy, and then about three, four, five years after that, it's legacy again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of what uh, you heard Jeff Bezos said, there will never be a day two for us. We're always mm. going to stay day one, yeah. focused on creating new stuff, because otherwise, once you go kind of steady state, the decline mm. is coming soon after. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think, it, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, now my, myself having started, um, I don't know, 20 plus years ago on scientific computing, and then, you know, meaning HPC and these sorts of efforts, and then showing up in sort of what one would call the quote unquote cloud world, um, 
the effort there has largely been the same. I mean, it's one of these ones where um, in infrastructure by its very nature is always risky to manage, you know, meaning um, things like continuously deploying things into infrastructure always runs the risk of making infrastructure inaccessible to people. Um, you know, you don't instantly, like if, if a new operating system image comes out, you don't reboot 100,000 servers. Um, and then the applications that sit on top of it and have historically inherited that risk from the infrastructure. Um, and the, the effort has largely been separating those two so that applications get freed of the risk from the underlying infrastructure. And then you can start applying a certain approach to the infrastructure not really caring about what's on it. And, and, and cloud is pretty much this emergence of infrastructure as its own practice. And it's going from traditional IT environments where that sort of operational model and that economic model is not the center of anybody's product designs to an operational and economic model that is at the center of everybody's sort of product designs. And, and the KPIs around what you're doing there and whether you're successful are relatively simple. And that is, you know, are you continuously improving in terms of capacity, capabilities, and unit economics? You know, if you're not, if you don't have a, you know, exponentially decreasing unit economic curve within, you know, a five year period of time, then you're probably not doing, you know, quote unquote cloud right. So, Jason, we, we know with Ericsson's background, you've got strong positions in the telecom <coughs> space, working a lot on the NFB solutions. I expect that's a, you know, hot area working with Red Hat. Mm -hmm. uh, C can you kind of sketch out for us just where Ericsson sits uh, in the marketplace today? You know where, where you know customers are coming to you, mm -hmm. kind of key partnerships. Yeah, I mean for us, I mean we're a 141 year old uh, Swedish Swedish multinational, and we've and we've been in the same business for 141 years, in that we provide the communication backbone for the world. Um, and so on, on one part of the business is if you see 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE or stuff on the phone, or if you use a mobile phone in somewhere like North America, 100% of all that traffic goes over um, Ericsson, you know, Ericsson applications. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're a, a very dominant provider of that, that radio edge, if you will. The other thing we have from an application portfolio perspective is everything you need to be a telecom. You know, so everything ranging from the, the network functions through OSS environments, BSS environments, customer front ends, uh, and, and the like. Uh, and the telecom space has been um, uh, undergoing some pretty uh, dramatic changes in some ways, or not dramatic changes, depending on one's, one's, one's sort of attitude over the, over the last few years. Um, the first one is even though that, 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 that far radio edge, if you will, um, has tens of millions of points of presence globally that talk to billions of devices, that's a very algorithmically driven, event driven, very industrialized type, type infrastructure. It's fair to say that if you look at the typical definition one would apply to hyperscale, um, it applies to the radio edge. Um, it also applies to the sort of hyperscale cloud providers. Uh, in between those two things is roughly about, you know, one to two trillion US dollars of investments that sits in tens of thousands of facilities globally with pretty much the computer history museum of hardware and operating systems and everything else in, inside of it. It's effectively this whole middle mile infrastructure. For us, we sort of view um, the virtualization of everything which, that's in the telecom space and uplifting it to a common infrastructure approach is, is, is pretty critical to get a handle on that, that middle mile infrastructure. Yeah. Jason, you know, when I think about the telecom space, you know, we're talking about 5G now. These rollouts tend to take a while. You know, we measure things in you know years, if not decades, for the rollout. Uh, yeah. Jim Whitehurst got on stage this morning, and said, you know, planning is dead. You know, we don't do a 10-year big data plan. We won't do a 10-year AI yeah. plan. How does you know your, your your set of the market live in this you know greater changing world? How do you look forward? Can you you know predict like well, we did in I the mean, past? That, that, yeah. That's a um, so I think I think yes and no. I mean, we you're you're correct in that if you take if you take a market like India, India is going to hit two hundred percent two G penetration in twenty twenty. Uh, you know, and so and we're talking about something that's going to happen. You know, twenty years after it started in other parts of the market, mm -hmm. uh, you have spots like Papua New Guinea that are have two G networks growing two hundred three hundred percent year over year. Yeah, and so when you when you look at this globally the rollout of these technologies are on typically a 30-year time schedule overall. 
um, and uh, they result in people owning assets that they have for at least 30 years, uh, in many many cases as well. So, so on one aspect, there is very long-term planning that has to exist, and we have some customers we've had for a century uh, from that, that point of view, and there have been those types of plans. On the other end is if you look at what we have to start doing from a technology standpoint, uh, is enabling just a tremendous amount of flexibility and the ability to just get out of this legacy hamster wheel, if you will. You know, this idea that the second you go and, and deploy something somewhere, um, you can't touch it again, and you can't continuously improve it again. Um, you know, we're trying to trying to sit down and say, you know, if we go out and do these types of deployments, we need the ability to actually continuously improve these. Um, in fact, that's that's really what the, the industrialized word 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 means for us. Um, and so, for for many of these things, um, you know, we've been taking certain approaches. I mean, interestingly enough, if you look at the the actual mobile edge of things, the radio edge of things, that is one where that is one hardware platform. It comes in tens of form factors. Um, we'll go and deploy out that infrastructure, and whether it's a 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, 5G narrowband IoT infrastructure is purely unlocked in software. Um, and so that is a good software-defined sort of infrastructure. Um, and uh, you do it that way because at the end of the day, somebody's got to go into a jungle and put a cell tower up, and you don't want to go out there again. And we want to take that same sort of thinking throughout the rest of the infrastructure. Yeah, J Jason, it always fascinates me. If, if you look at this space, I mean, I remember we interviewed you back at Joint. You know, mm -hmm. we're talking a lot of the show about containers, and yep. there's things that we've tried in the past, and yep. now it's coming at it again. Um, you know, edge computing, uh, you know, is something we're starting to talk about. Yep. You know, it, it's a little bit difficult to predict how long some of that will take and some yep. of those cycles, but maybe to wrap us up, t talk to us a little bit about just, you know, your, Ericsson's planning for the future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are some of those big challenges that you see that we as an industry need to tackle, and you know, maybe some of the, the, the things that will, kind of earlier wins and stuff that, you know, might take a little bit longer. Yeah, I mean, a little bit longer, I mean, if I look out, really probably the next 15, 20 years, I mean, the, the type of middle mile industrialization they're doing today is a prerequisite for all the IoT use cases to show up on 5G, because there's simply not enough middle mile capacity in the world or capabilities there to even have it go to an Amazon type, type perspective. So even, even if that all ends up there, um, so now it's going to be this very large effort of, uh, I think, bringing these two worlds together. You know, on the, on the hyperscale cloud providers, you have a very industrialized approach in infrastructure, and it's very supply chain driven, and it's very sort of easy to cookie cutter out. On the extreme end of the infrastructure, on the radio edge, it's the same way. Um, and uh, but all the stuff in the middle's not. Uh, and if you look at the challenge from a, from a cloud perspective, it's about um, taking, taking those sort of learnings from the bookends of the infrastructure, bringing it to the middle, if you will, um, and starting to think about you know, what, because edge computing's a great example, it's like what, what does it mean when you start using that from an end user perspective? You know, you're not going to go to a pull down menu and pick 12,418 availability <laughs> zones from a list of 120,000 global availability zones. You know, you're not going to automatically have issues around data sovereignty and everything else like that to sort of be tackled. Um, and so I, so I think in many ways when we start looking at um, some core concepts that live in hundreds of facilities and sort of large cloud providers and some of these concepts where we've managed to do things in tens of millions of base stations, talking to billions of devices, you know, the reality for me is when you look at the, 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 the redo and now the, the more global use of that infrastructure that's in the middle, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require um, developer accessibility and a certain degree of programmability that doesn't actually exist yet. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, it's an open question of how much you do it. I mean, you know, meaning you're gonna, have to, you're, you're gonna have to scale topologically rather than sort of scale in other ways. And, right. and, and a lot of that stuff's just not, not done yet. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. We really yeah. appreciate your time. Anytime. We'll be back with more of theCUBE's coverage of the Red Hat Summit after this.